G'day folks and welcome to another episode of Encounters Down Under. We have Oliver joining us on the show who has had multiple experiences with beings from his childhood that even escalated to involving his family. Now I must warn you, there is an extreme language warning and we also went a bit Joe Rogan with this episode, so this will be a part one of two episodes. We also had some technical difficulties making me a bit quiet of this episode. But without further ado, welcome to the show, Oliver. Mate, welcome to the show. Um, you're the um, guest for episode four, mate. Um, so uh-huh. Welcome to the show, Oliver, mate. You've um, hit me up there. Go and tell us about your uh, experiences there, mate. So, yeah, yep, let's go to the show and um, tell us about your experience, mate. All right. So, um, yeah, I'm 39, so, you know, it's been a while since I've had sort of even thought about it, talked about it, but I've come across the web, the uh, Facebook page, and I thought I'd have a go. and. Uh, yeah, you know, spread some light on some of this stuff. Um, so where do I start? Basically, I'll start with the earliest uh, experience. So basically, it just started with like a simple sighting. Um, I was at a barbecue. It was in, um, I think it was in like Liverpool, Western Sydney area. And um, at the time, and we were visiting some people as a barbecue and there was something flying overhead and it was quite a big sort of uh, disc shape. Um sort of like uh, just like a typical flying saucer shape with um, big bulbs on the side. And um, they had quite bright lights, uh, quite well lit, probably like green and red. Um, yeah, big lights. And the, and the outside sort of bags were kind of rotating around the outside of there, out, out, on, the, on the outside of this uh, disc and, it didn't really make sense to me till later on, till I was like, uh, you know, able to sort of reprocess the the memory. Yeah. But um, I did have a good long term memory because I did have a lot of um, a very active and busy early part of my life. So I, when I was like one years old in like 1983, my dad actually took me to Fiji, and my first few years were actually spent in Fiji. So I had a lot of big experiences. I didn't just sit in front of a TV and. That's why I can remember a long way back because um, I had a lot of big events. So, um, so that was the first one. Um, and then basically from, from there, there wasn't really anything, um, you know, supernatural or anything unexplainable. But sort of when I got to about 1992, um, just before I turned 11, um, we we were living in Tasmania by this stage, and um, we moved out to a remote part of uh, the Tasmanian bush, which is a, it's an area called um, the Wailanka Forest. It's an old growth forest. Um, it's owned by the State Forest Forestry Commission um, and controlled by them. There's a lot of um, protests and things up through through there to do with like logging and all that sort of stuff. But it's a, it's an unserviced area, so there's no uh, well back then there was no uh, uh, electricity, um, there was no water supply, none of that. Everybody who lived out in that in that sort of valley and in the bush out there was completely off grid and self sufficient. Um, the only thing some people might have had a phone. You could get a phone line out there back then, um, but the way we had it set up was. Um, uh, t- big truck batteries, DC deep cycle uh, truck batteries, and a couple of solar panels, and that was back in the early early nineties, so not early mid nineties. And um, and the water we pumped it up there from the what's called the Sandspit River, which is a river that comes runs through the Wailanka Forest. Um, you can Google it if you're wondering. It's southeastern Tasmania, um, so it's quite remote. It's probably to get out of there from where I. Where we were located is probably if you go north of there up the east coast, it's called W Road. It's a forestry road. It's not um, it's not our public road. It's a forestry commission road, um, and some quite you know bizarre things happen up in that forest because it's so isolated and it's so terrifyingly scary at night um, that. Uh, you know, it's 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 really getting out there. It really is. It's probably 30, 40 k's north to the nearest town. I think is Orford, along the, from where we were. And probably if you were heading south, that would take you onto a place called um, 
called Copping, and if you took a left at Copping, that would take you to Port Arthur. That's just to give people a bit of a reference as to where I was. So I was right smack bang in old groves, you know, forests, um, taken away from civilization for whatever reason. Dad decided to move in with the uh, the wicked stepmother who lived in a uh, like an ancient schoolhouse. It used to be a, uh, a logging town back in the, I don't know when, but it was a logging town, and this is the only building left from that old colonial logging era. Okay. And, um, and so that's just to give you a bit, bit of an idea. So I lived in this, um, so I had this sort of main house, which they, you know, you cooked dinner and all that. It was um, used a slow combustion fire and all that sort of stuff. So um, as you can imagine, quite clear skies, Tasmania out there in the bush, no no lights, completely um you know, clear, clear as you can you can imagine. So, um, anyway, so we moved out there. I wasn't real too happy about it because I was happy to see my mates and had a little girlfriend, all that sort of stuff. So I was be um not too happy about being out there. Anyway, the way the house was, the uh, the bathroom was up on stilts, sort of thing, and out away from the house. Okay. It was a separate building. And there was a, uh, a bed in there, which sometimes when people stay out, they used to stay in there. So you had like the bathroom there and had, had the bed right in front of the, this sort of big, probably a 1.2 by 1.2 square window. And you, my bed was right in front of the window. And so this was early after, like not long after moving out there. And um, I wake up one morning, probably real middle of the night, really like 3, 3.30, something like that. Um, I just was looking out the window and, um, looked out the window and it's just another another night, I suppose. And then all of a sudden from the north and I'm looking north, um, there was a, quite a large sort of disc, like a large disc, just like you'd think, yeah, imagine a flying saucer disc. Yeah. Um, and a few from the mass directly towards my location. And it friendly, it stepped above the house, directly above above the house, because I was looking at the house from, from the from the bathroom from where I was from where I was sleeping. So and I remember just going like I was ten, maybe eleven, and I was, yeah, it's just like what, didn't really believe what I was seeing. Like, you know, I hadn't had anything other than that first little sighting, which really didn't make sense anyway. And this is hovering 150, I reckon 150 to 200 meters above the house. So I was just hovering there. And and I'm looking up and it's just so bright, sliding the whole, you imagine because it's how dark, how dark it is, like just with the still of the night, clear night, not a cloud in the sky. Um, and I don't remember it being an overly starry night for some reason either. It was one of them sort of dark nights with a moon, you know, sort of between moons kind of thing where it's kind of darkish. Okay. Anyway, so it's kind of a very, very clear, but I don't remember being overly starry. So anyway, um, it's just hovering there. And I remember distinctly going, this is, am I actually asleep still? Like, is this a dream? Um, and I remember vividly like pinching myself to cause myself some pain to realize, oh, no, I'm, I'm actually seeing this. Like I'm actually, you know, this is actually here and, and I'm, I'm looking. I wasn't scared at all. The whole thing about it is that there was no fear in me at all. I was absolutely as calm like I just finished an hour-long meditation or something, you know, like I was completely calm, which is another bizarre thing about it because normally, you know, everybody's real f- we're a fear-based animal, so like you see something like that, normally you'd want to get the hell out of there or hide or be hiding yeah. in the corner or something. Um, so, yeah, I knew what fear was. I was in a massive cyclone in 1986, one of my earliest memories. I was in a cyclone on an island in Fiji, um, 280 kilometer hour winds, you know, like we had to come, that's why we came back to Australia. So I knew what fear was. I knew what hiding under the bed was. You know, I was in, I was in a, I was in a buoy, you know, grass huts, and the roof was actually sucked off, and I was hiding under the bed. You know, like I remember, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, and that was like that's one of my. I was like four, maybe that stage four and a half. And so I knew what fear was, but no, I was calm, like as calm as you could imagine. 
And uh, like he was sitting there watching a waterfall or something, you know, and, and I'm just amazed, blown away. Like, wow, what am I looking at? You know, it's oh, there. Right. Yeah, yeah, t- absolutely. Absolutely. Locking, locked onto it with uh, my eyes. Like I couldn't look away from it. You know, I was just that, wow, what am I looking at? And then, um, and then uh, uh, probably 15, 20 minutes, I'd have to say, like, yeah, it could have been longer, could have been less. I don't know because perception of time when you're when you're really engrossed in something could be skewed. So I'm just trying to give a bit a rough. That's my perception of the time that passed was probably about fifteen to twenty minutes that it was above the house. It could have been longer. Um. So anyway, it didn't move. It was just it was just hovering there silently, absolutely silently, lighting up the whole this whole. Like we're sort of in a clearing in the forest, you know, yep. and uh, probably probably about 15, 20 minutes in, these glowing um, orbs, they're sort of like, uh, it's like a light bulb, just the same size as a light bulb, just two round light bulbs came down, and I was, same light sort of texture as the craft itself, like very bright orbs. They came down from this from this craft. They came down, and they these two of them they came down together in tandem. Probably they always seemed to be the same distance apart from each other. That's what I always remember about it. Is that they weren't sort of mingling in with each other. They were they always maintained a distance from each other. So these two orbs came down, and they kind of flew down, glided down, and they sat outside of my window, and they were. I don't know whether you call it communicating with each other or something because one would flash and the other one would flash and the other one would flash, the other one would flash. Like there was a bit of a, I wouldn't say a pattern because the length of the flashes seemed to vary. Like when they were flashing, it wasn't like, like a Morse code sort of thing where it's all like beep, beep, beep. The cadence of the of how long it would flash on and off changed or varied between each flash. Like it was sort of sporadic a little bit. The way they, but I felt that they were communicating with each other. Whatever these things were, that was my interpretation at the time. Being you know, ten, eleven year old kid, um, prepubescent, you know, just probably about a year away from hitting puberty. Really, I was a pretty small kid myself, late bloomer. Um, yeah, and I was just, and I was just still just wow, you know, like when I'm like still blown away by the whole situation. Yeah, it was still to calm at the same time. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely, no, no fear at all. It's, um, yeah, I, I, that, that's one of the things that um, I still look back at it and go, yeah, it's pretty amazing there was that calm, you know. Um, but again, maybe I was desensitized a little bit from the, being in an extreme situation where it was a, you know, a cyclone. You know, I got up the next day during that cyclone and I'd seen um, a dec- uh, decapitated body with the head severed you know because the the big the, the big building that was um near the barre um it's a sugarcane plantation where we were we lived with like indians and fijians and you know we blend in with the villages and all that sort of stuff so i was right in in, in with the culture and everything and and um yeah the, the big um corrugated iron um shed um had had collapsed and blown in and and the tin must have gone in in such a fashion where it actually took one of the the people's heads off yeah so that so that's so i was like four four and a half or so would i'd i'd seen like that you know that's one of my earliest memories is a, a decapitated body um so maybe i was desensitized a little bit to extreme things there's a possibility there um so um yeah so that so basically these these orbs um, it's the best way to describe them. Everyone who's involved in this sort of understands what orbs are or orb lightning. Everyone's researched that. Um, and they say it in, has intelligence and all that sort of stuff. Well, these bees obviously had their own intelligence, these, these, these orbs. So after that, um, yeah, after about that 20 minute period, after those orbs came down, this, this craft just took off back in the same direction, back in towards the north, um, that it came from absolutely silently. And it, and it sort of gradually went up and up and up up you know up into the sky kind of thing and disappeared from from view just just disappeared it just went yeah silently 
um, it probably took big craft. I try to I try to give you a dimension of it, yep. um, so people can you know how big is this thing? Um, let's say almost. Let's say that basketball court length, okay, like diameter. That's a pretty decent size. Maybe, maybe rough, like 200, you're thinking 200, 200 metres up. It, it covered the entire roof of the the house. It's quite a big old, it's a big old schoolhouse, so it's quite a large single building. Um, you know, so probably if, at least at least a football, oh, no, sorry, a basketball court. In length, maybe maybe a bit longer, maybe just a bit longer because it overhang. It was it was covering the whole, the whole house, but it was a two hundred, but probably one hundred fifty, two hundred meters up. Yes. Anyway, I suspected it would be pretty large object either way. Pretty large. Yeah, it was pretty big. It was pretty big. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I probably wasn't thinking in terms of oh yeah, how big is this, and you know, scientific like that, like oh yeah. Get the rule. Or how big is that? Like, I was just blown away by the whole the whole thing. I was sort of taken, completely absorbed in the moment. Um, so it it, it took us, um, and it probably took. Oh man, I reckon two to five seconds to completely go north and up, like and out of view. Like two to five seconds to really like. And that's on a clear night where you could see something going as far away as you could, you know what I mean? Like if something was just flying away, like a plane, yep. you would be able to see it for like ages and ages and ages and, and watch it go. Ever, you ever watched, just watched a plane like, you know, yeah, go and just yeah. watch, right? What most, what a, yeah, you do it nothing, you see a plane, you see how far you can see it till. Well, yeah. it takes a while for it to cross the sky. This thing just went boom. Within within two to five seconds, this thing took, took off. Yeah, wow. And, and and disappeared from view, and there were no clouds. It didn't disappear behind the clouds or anything. It was a clear night. It just went bang, gone. So um, anyway, um, these from this point forward, um, over the next, particularly over the next twelve months, um, played a very sort of regular role, like nightly, like in my life. Like these orbs would, um. I had a room, like a, a room kind of built for me. Like my dad was a, a bricklayer and a builder, so he built me a room. And it was a, a double, it was like a, a its own sort of self-contained building in a sense that was separate to the old house. So I slept separate to the main house um, in the middle of this forest, you know, like shit myself every night. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah, the, these, whatever they were, were, were just interested in me for some reason. They were always sort of outside my windows. The way my, the way my room and the door was, the f- door was set up, there was always a gap between the top of the door and the roof. It's just the way the, you know, a bit of a rustic sort of set up as some of these bush properties are, you know. So, yeah. um, the top of the door wasn't sealed off to the outside. So, I would have them in my room from time to time, and I would be so scared that I would be um, underneath my my blanket, and I'd just have a little hole so I could breathe fresh air, and I'd just like have be peeking like through the thing because these things would be in in my room. Yep. Um, I became less and less kind of scared over time of them because they didn't. I never they never hurt me or anything, but the things that. Um, kind of uh really did scare me were you know when you wake up at in the middle of night in a completely dark place where there is no lighting there is no light switch you've got to actually get out and light a candle um when there's a little being in your room that's about one you know 1.2 meters high you know a little a little you know it's got two arms two legs and a head and it's standing there in the in the dark of the room um your your fear level goes completely to a whole no, a whole another like another dimension. I think it'd be like absolute terror. Yeah, you're too scared to to scream. You're too scared to make any sound. Like, you know, um, you know, I was only what ten, eleven. You know, I was fucking terrified, and <clears throat> the 
the, these those were the 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 initial um, sort of I suppose ETs, if you want to call them that. Um, I didn't really have a name name for them or anything other than I was just terrified of these things. And um, they, and then at the same time, you have sort of repressed repressed memories or things that you remember in the morning, like what the hell has happened. Um, I remember being on a board, um, actually being taken outside. It was just like hovering this little sort of board that I was sort of placed on. Okay. And um, by the by, these these little um, these short ones, and they're not, not the um, the typical greys that you see, like Whitley, Whitley Stryber and the you know the books like that. We got the praying mantis grey with the big arm and eyes. <clears throat> I never seen them. I have seen um, the ones that used to interact with me were probably one point two meters high, um, so they were short, like four foot. But instead of the big arm and eyes, they just had perfectly round dark eyes oh right per- perfectly round and they were they were short um and quite that's about all i can really tell you about them they were short and they were, they're incredibly strong because they just pick you up yeah okay they, so, pick- they have the same sort of common alien head shape that's everyone like stereotypical shape was you know? no, not, not re- that i can remember and you have to remember it was always really really dark like, it was always dark like when when you you sort of wake up and these things, and they they basically get you get you, coerce you internally inside, like to come with them. So there's an element of there's an element of consent um, between you and them, and you're so scared that you don't know how to resist, and also you can't move. They they. Yeah, you know, uh, everyone probably aware of that by now. You know that they can control your your movement and your 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 voice, all that. So you could scream as loud as you like, and it sounds like you're you're screaming into a paper cup. You know, like it, it's it's not going anywhere. You know, you ever done that thing with a paper cup and a string, and you're like, yeah, I need to get all you know all that. It, 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 there's a good depiction of that, and it's um. Fire in the Sky. Have you heard of the movie Fire in the Sky? Have, yeah. yeah, have you seen that? No, I haven't watched. And you, you, there's a good depiction of like where he's sort of where he's up on the craft, and it's the typical ones that yeah, you know, the typical sort of praying mantis looking ones, and and he's um screaming at the top of his lungs, but it's like really quiet. It's that's what it's that's what it's like. You're screaming as loud as you can, but but nothing's coming out. You can yell. Yeah, they, they, they've got control of. <laughs> And by entire the entire situation, the whole virus thing, they're in charge. Uh, but you've, but, but at the same time, you have to cons- that there's an element of your own personal will because this existence that we're in, um, yeah. these kinds of things, that there's always an element of your own will to to everything. Yeah, it's to everything we do in this life. There is an element of our own will, and that comes from inside your own spirit that says yes or no. Like there's a deep down. So you have to, if you're having these problems with these things, then there's an element inside you which needs to really um, learn how to fight them on an in, in, on an internal battle to try and gain some control over your own your own will because they dominate your will. That's all they do. Because it requires, again, it requires a consent. There's an element of consent or your willingness to, to, to go along with it or go with them. So I remember being strapped to this board anyway. So I remember being not strapped, but I was placed on this board like a silver. I remember it was, it was perfectly shiny, like polished stainless steel. And it was kind of like, kind of like, uh, what's the best way to put it? A surf pad? Shape, okay. maybe, and taken outside. I was on this board. It seemed to float, like just like a little craft or a little hovercraft or something like that. And I was taken outside by this thing or a group of them, and outside past the past the old bathroom where I was initially staying. And I remember going. From ground level to as high as far 
and as far above the trees as you can imagine in in an eye blink, boom, like that, like bang. And that and that's and that's where that memory ends. That memory ends there. I don't remember anything from from after that. But I remember seeing the I've seen the earth like high altitude of the earth, not the entirety of the earth, but I've seen the a very high altitude um, picture of the earth from my own my own eyes. That, 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 wow, like you're using an aircraft or something like look out the window. No, it was wow, a lot higher than that. Yeah, I had I had an aircraft like you can see, like it just it just sucked me up like like I was um uh, like I was like, exactly like being in a vacuum like like imagine imagine you're like being sucked up imagine you're sucking up a cockroach in, in a vacuum yep. like that just that that kind of thing it's just like boosh like pulled me up and that was that was the the first experience of um that I remember. I was being taken somewhere else. I, but I don't remember what happened, and, and that's one of the things that is always frustrating for me is that I don't know what happened, uh, you know, on the other side of that. I don't know what the interactions involved. I don't know um, anything. And, and there's all that, always that element that was it just some weird dream? Was it some sort of astral plating, or was it? Some something like that, interdimensional instead of rather be, rather than being, you know, a three dimensional experience. Was it a was it operating in, in some other, you know, alternate realm as well? Is it there's that pos- possibility? I'm open to that idea, um, but it certainly felt extremely real at the time. Um, so, so there was those kinds of things, and they they come into my they come into my room i'd wake up and they would it would be in, they'd, they'd communicate through the mind so they'd be it was it was always silent it was always come come with us come with us well it was always that repeatedly over and over and over it's kind of like like a hypnotist in a way like the way a hypnotist would go about um sort of that sort of uh what do they call it um and uh, what hypnosis use? They use your own your own will basically to allow someone to just kind of gain some control in a way. That's kind of like what hypnosis do. So by repeating things over and over in a certain certain way. Well, that's kind of how it come across in the in the in the mind. They would just like come with us and just laying there, absolutely terrified, terrified. Like I can't describe the terror to you. Like words don't justify. Like the 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 sheer utter terror that I went through um, out there. Um, also being in such an isolated place as well, like being in such an isolated place, um, it just adds a whole other element to it as well. Like there's no, there's no other neighbours to scream to. Half the neighbours didn't like each other anyway. So <laughs> that's that kid. Let's look and- we're talking pre ninety six Tasmania. Everyone, how everyone was loaded, locked and loaded with firearms. It was, you know, that's the way it was out there. So, um, it was a very gun gun happy, trigger happy place, uh, especially out there, and especially out there in that bush, you know. Um, a little bit of a totally, totally different sort of. No, we're, we're, we're a it, different environment. No, it was um, happy of war. Or what? Okay. This is no cops. Cops, if they come out, cops come out there. That's usually for a drug bust. A lot of big pot growers out there, um, and so if the police were a raid out there, they'd always come with like a huge, like t- multiple cars, like ten, fifteen cars, helicopters. Like that was back in the nineties. Yeah, yeah, because because people out there aren't going to take any shit. Like if you you just a cop by yourself out there, you're going to shit you and fucking. This bought before GPS. <laughs> it's a place where you go missing. That while well, like the forest, so you can hide someone out there, no problems, no problems there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially the boogeyman is out there, man. The boogeyman is in that forest. Um, so I'll have to wonder if there was um in the early days. I don't know much about like the indigenous population. I wonder what happened to them. I have to wonder if there's like an old burial ground there or. <laughs> something you know something there's some old spirits there that don't want you there or something but yeah it's definitely a, it's a strange place yeah yeah i wonder i just wonder because the tasmanian aboriginals were treated pretty badly and i always wondered you know um you know what happened to them out here you know did that did it set off something you know like some yeah. demon or something you know like 
bad spirits. I don't know. So anyway, um, um, the next, uh, so that was, there was a couple of those, um, experiences. And you remember this is like, man, I have to be honest, probably twice a week, a couple of times a week, this would, this, these kinds of interactions would, would go on. Um, you know, you have to remember that they don't have to hide anything. There's no, there's no neighbors. There's no, no one to report anything. Yeah, they thought it's pushed themselves there to go. The fed, the fed, mobile phones and everyone having a camera and Wi-Fi and, you know, it was all, it was, uh, they had free reign out there to do whatever they wanted, obviously. Yeah. So, um, the next really, um, different one was, um, I woke up one night and so my nights were constantly being disturbed by all this sort of weird stuff that was going on and, and. Yeah, you know, my dad being a, a real Yorkshireman and in, proper Englishman, you know, it's just like harden up, son. Like, you know, if I can, <laughs> you know, shut the fuck up, son. You know, if I he was a proper hard, he's very really hard man. So, um, he's a bricklayer, and you know, he's just a, a mason as well. So, like a like a stone mason. You know, he's a very, but he was, all, all of his friends were also Freemasons as well. So, um, he, he himself wasn't a Freemason, but he was like. A lot of his friends and and associates yeah, and stuff were anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Hey, everyone there, mate. Uh, just remind our all listeners here to get some questions. Yeah, they've got any, any questions regarding the uh, previous experience there to go and put some in the comments there. I'll read them out to them to you so you can now um, answer them. So yeah, by all means, yeah, by all means, guys, get in there and uh, ask some questions that uh, bring you curiosity. But uh, what, one of the questions I want to ask you on the um, one there with the these objects coming out the window there. Um, do, you, do you like take any notice of like any time frames, or, like take notice of what time these were happening around or if there's like any sort of missing time between? Like do you know if, um, like because you might be looking at the window at one point. Yeah. You know, hey, it's like nine o'clock at night or something like that and the next minute you go back there and it's like, oh, it's three o'clock now. No, um, as I said, like I reckon it was only there 15, 20 minutes but it could have been longer because it wasn't that long after it took off out of my view that the sun started coming up. So I could have been there for a solid hour, two hours. Who knows? Yeah. Cause it was, it was dark. It was proper night, like full thick night, you know, when, when I first came over the house, but when, after it left, it was, you know, morning and time to get up anyway. Um, you know, I was an early riser as a kid. So, yeah, I was up doing my thing in the morning. So, um, yeah, it, it could have been there for a couple of hours. It could have been, there could have been lost time. I, ha- I have had that on, on, on later, later, um, parts of my life. I've actually had it while I was driving. So I've, I've, I've <laughs> yeah, no, I've ended, I ended up from one place to another in a very short space of time. I'll just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's been other there's been other things there's been other things that have gone on which which are probably more on the extreme end um in terms of that sort of lost time and yeah all that sort of thing so it does happen it, it and, and i i'm in two minds I, I don't know whether they're really operating in this reality or whether it's operating in a different different um dimension so to speak like interdimensional and i, I kind of lean lean towards them being in, interdimensional because they've they've got control of time and space um it would when when also that sort of theory anyway like a lot of ex- there's a the, sort of come down that sort of path there's a potential there and and, and um so i don't know if anyone's going to other questions but um but yeah i'll be a four foot high they, they were hairless sort of um i wouldn't say round sort of heads like it's kind of squarish in a way kind of blockhead little things but yeah totally perfect perfectly round dark eyes not not the typical almond because i used to read some of the whitley striber stuff and it's got yeah communion and all that it's got the yeah the prey mantis looking ones with the, yeah. the big almond eyes and that wasn't what i'd experienced i hadn't experienced those Zeta reticuli or whatever they're called. Um, mine were different. Um, the other ones that came on, they came in later as I as I grew into adulthood. There were there were other ones that got involved. Um, so 
So I suppose we'll move on to the next, the next, like, so I woke up one, one night and I felt myself getting lifted out of bed. So I was sort of lifted out of bed. Um, and I don't know if they were physically, I don't remember anyone grabbing me and moving me. I don't remember anyone like picking me up and like moving me. I never remember really physical direct contact in, in a way, like, I don't know whether they were able to make me levitate or make me manipulate me in that way, but I remember being stiff as a board yeah, and and sort of on a weird angle, raised up out of bed, and they, it looked like the end of, like, I don't know, just like a beam of light came out of, from the hand sort of thing. It was like a big beam of light that came out of the hand and it went straight through my eyes and this sort of waves of like uh, like a big current being shot through your body, just like one after the other, like a big wave. I don't even know what was going on. I, did, I, I all the stuff just blows your mind. If you feel, if any of this stuff happens, it just overtakes you in the moment. There's no even time to respond because you're asleep and then you wake up and this is happening. I've been awake for two seconds. What's going on here? Um, and yeah, these these sort of um, beams of light were not just beams of light; they were sort of like energy beams or something. Because it because it I could feel it go right through my body. It's this whole yeah, it's hard to explain. I can't really fully explain it properly. Electrical sort of jolts or an that, or just like a warm fuzzy. It wasn't the pain. It wasn't it wasn't the pain of like being tased or zapped. But it was it was a definitely an, an electric current like that went through like through my eyes and just went through my body and just like over and over and over again like just one after the other just like like being zapped but without the pain so imagine being tased but it doesn't cause the muscle contractions and doesn't hurt but it's completely going through your body like a big current like of 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 energy is the way way to put it, and so that that went for. It was rapid. That was like boom, like the cadence. So that was like, like one, two, three. Like that's just what through a body, like wave after wave after wave, or boom, 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 boom. And um, then the next, uh, I remember just being back in bed, go to sleep. You know, like I wasn't even like. Uh, in a ball and a heap on the ground fucking crying, you know, like <laughs> with my dad, there was no one to cry to anyone. No one to cry to. It, it, it would have fucking clocked me for crying. Um, <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was um, with, with him. It was very much, um, you know, men don't cry sort of thing. Like, yeah, he, he his dad was, um, like two war veteran as well. Like he went to World War Two in career and and you know had seen a lot of things. So he he was kind of hard on him too, I think. And um and uh, but the family's probably got like you know at least a thousand years of military service all the way down the line and various different people and um you know the thing about your DNA, you, your ancestry is important. Um, all your ancestors like memories and, and experiences that they have in their life, yep. they they attach themselves to to their DNA. So when you know you, you swim out of your, your dad's ball sack, <laughs> um all their experiences and that that's that, that point in their life and all your ancestors before them um actually are attached to the DNA as well. So your experiences affect your DNA. Yeah. Um I have a question. So it's, yeah, we go. I think it was into regards to the yeah. energy going through it. Uh, there was no pain. Yes. No, no, no pain at all. As I said, it's not like not like being tased where or shocked um, where you've got that that sharp yeah you know, electricity pain. No, it's like similar thing where you've got a current of energy going through your body, but with no no pain at all. Like there was no, it didn't hurt, and I don't think they were ever out to physically physically hurt me. Um, they're still in it for their own agenda. They, these these particular ones um, are purely in it. They're, they're, they're not evil, I would say, but again, everything's on their terms. So they're, they're definitely in it for their own 
and whatever that was. I was never, as I said, I, 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 ne- I used to, the memories always end as I, as I was taken, like just as I was taken, it was always, they always ended. So, so that, that's always a big block there. And I've never gone to a hypnotist and gone, oh, who do I go to? Like, <laughs> There's one in America or something. Who, who do I go to? That that's uh, one in Queensland here. Yeah, yeah I, I I wouldn't know who to go to. I, I'd I'd be really I'd be really curious and interested to see what would come out of it because the next one that that um I remember uh, more vividly the, the the beings themselves as well. And um, we were visiting a friend down in down in Copping, the town of Copping. Um, there's a museum there, a uh, um, uh, convict museum. You can see like the bear traps and man traps and all, you know, all the old convict stuff. There's a, there's a museum there. It's a it's a junction, little junction town where you stop there to get fuel and and that. You can see the convict museum before you go to um before you head off into uh, Port Arthur. So anyway, they had the big house there and with it and it was um uh I think 1993. Um, and it was the World Cup final or something. And my dad being a, you know, a pom, um, he wanted to, I think Manchester, oh, no, that was World Cup, sorry, it was the FA Cup or some, Premier League, some shit like that. Yep. I never followed it, but um, he, he liked Manchester United and we went there to a friend's place to go and watch it because we couldn't get TV reception where we lived. So we went there and it was a mass, big old house, big old house. Yeah, you know, the kids are at one end doing whatever parents at the other you know, like you can you no one you can't hear anybody you know like it's a big house so um so what's the watch the football everyone you know all right cool kids go to their room and we're all sleeping like in in one of the big rooms inside with a fire fireplace because oh, yeah. middle of winter and it's cold you know it's really cold down there yep in middle of winter so um the fire's gone so we're all crashing on couches or whatever you know it's pretty cool and I kind of liked one of their daughters too, so I was sort of, you know, been a sus cunt, but. You know, what I mean? so I was checking her out that and trying to be friendly, be too friendly, maybe. But um, she was having a bar it. But um, anyway, uh, let's start young, Dad says, man. So um, anyway, uh, <laughs> at least she wasn't related to me, right? That's um, then, like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, um, so. This particular um, time, um, whatever date that the FA Cup or the Premier, whatever date that was, it was middle of winter. It was green, like during the day it was cold, but it was green. And the next day when I woke up, it was it was completely snowy. But in that night, after everybody went to sleep, um, I got woken up again and I was lifted up, carried. And this time, I, this this particular time. I do remember being actually carried by these things. And it's very strange because I'm in there with a group of people and completely silently. And they were, there was probably half a dozen of them rather. Usually it was just one, this one that was in front of me, but like when I was in my room, but this particular time there's about Probably half a dozen. There's probably half a dozen, and and there's a bit of a hierarchy amongst amongst them because one there'll be one's kind of directing them. He's standing off to the off to the side, yeah, and he's kind of directing them or he's in charge or something. So he like there's a bit of a hierarchy amongst these ones. So, um, and they literally carried me towards the up the hallway, the front, the, the hallway of the house, towards the front door which which was weird because these people didn't use the front door they never used the front door it was always the side side doors or the back it was a proper big house big old stone house from the convict era it was a big old house and um solid house made out of stone yeah. and um so anyway um yeah they, i i remember being taken out the front and i'm just look able to look around though like i was able to actually move my head at this time like i could move a little bit more the other times is completely stiff, but I think through the various interactions, they kind of maybe give you a little, more, little bit more control. I don't know, but I could move my head at least this time. And I remember just looking around, just like blown away again, because every time is like, wow, you have to think like every time is, e- even though I'd had it before a few t- a couple of times or a few times that I could recall, 
this it was it's still an amazing experience in itself and also terrifying still terrif yeah. like it would. it's it's still terrifying you can't i don't think you you can get conditioned enough to to just be like oh yeah you know that uh, this happened again like it's every time is terif was terrifying for me and um i don't think anyone, honestly, I don't think anyone would be conditioned to it <laughs> no 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 but It'd be different if he's knocked on the door and said, "Hey, you going? I'd like to meet you. Or, you know, can I run a few tests?" You know. Yeah. Um. So anyway, um. Yeah. So yeah, t they they carried me and they and I I remember being taken out the front door, doors open, and it had been snowing, um, overnight. And it stayed quite heavily that night, and they, I just remember being as really really bright when we were, as soon as that door opened it was just really really bright like the most uh just overpoweringly bright and that's where that memory ends yeah so things so i know the light is sort of what's knocking you out i don't think that's a memory eraser i just think there's i, I don't know i i, I don't know maybe Not it's so maybe it's a, a racy memory but it's something just that just knocks you out at that point there where your consciousness just isn't there anymore <laughs> Maybe you're just not able to handle it. It's so stressful that you could pass out. There's a possibility of that too. Like, it is possible to pass out from something that's too much stress. Your body will. And like, you know, if you're, if you're parachute, you know, if you're, you're jumping, you're using a parachute, there's a good chance you'll be unconscious before you hit the ground because you, you'll be, you know, like you, you just pass out. You, know, It's too much. It's a safety mechanism. So you don't, you know, don't feel the impact sort of thing. So it does happen. Um, so that memory ends, and that's one there that I'd love to go and, um, you know, have have a some kind of session and figure out what happened that night, because I was able to, everything was a lot more vivid, and and you know I could actually see them, and you know, this time they were making themselves a little bit more known to me rather than just one in my room. Um, there was a group of them, you know, like yeah. they were exposing themselves to me. So again, I wake up. The following day in the morning, in my bed, you know what I mean? I just wake up in my bed, like returned, woke up, no one, no one's none the wiser, no one knows anything. I'm just like, there's no one I can talk to about it. I, I was aware something had happened, um, but I just shook it off as another fucked up experience and um, looked out, looked outside and it was, you know, probably... Yeah, foot and a half, probably forty centimeters of snow all around the house. It was absolutely like snow covered, like yeah. the whole area. It snowed really heavy that night. So, um, you know, southern Tasmania, southeast Tasmania. So, um, yeah. So that that was that experience, and that was that was that was probably one of the more. I don't know. I just remember it a lot more. It's not as hazy as the other ones. There's still a lot of haze with the other ones, but this one was like crystal clear going out the door, like till that moment like it's crystal clear like you know i was i was awake you know yeah. did you try and to so, see if there was any impressions in the snow where they would have been walking to the front door at all i actually the 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 next day i did have a bit of a look but see that door wasn't used they didn't use that door so it was a big big front door and they didn't use that front that door so i kind of had to you know i had to go outside and go around the house to yeah, you don't interrupt. I was always taught, you know, you don't interrupt the way people do things in their house. I'm just going to open this door because I had bikes in that in the front. Like, and it was a, more of like a, yeah, we leave our bikes and shoes and all that shit in the front, yeah. and they never actually used the front. So I didn't want to go there and open this door that they never used. So I did have a look. Look, to be honest with you, I couldn't tell whether there was footprints or or anything like that. And uh, you know, I'm not just going to say for the sake of it that there was all these little little um you know, three-toed feet or sort of footprints in the snow or something, you know, like, I, I couldn't tell you. I, I'll only tell you what, you know, what I can actually genuinely recall yeah. um, as, as, as an experience. But I remember going and ha I actually did go and have a look and I was like looking around like, well, like, did it actually happen? Because you're, you're still questioning your own reality at this point. You know, you, you're you I'm 11 years old. There's literally no one to tell about it. I'm in my own world dealing with this because it's so regular um that just in my life it's just part of my my existence and i w wasn't going attending school because we lived out in the bush um i was doing like a homes uh 
some sort of uh, correspondence school, which I was I was just refusing to do it anyway because I was kind of being a shit cunt myself because I didn't want to be out there. So I was, I was kind of at war with my stepmother. So I was like, well, you know, I'll, I'll just be really, really fucking difficult. Um, yeah, rebelling a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was um, – one of my jobs I used, to, I used to be fucking terrified to do, but um, I had to chop a lot of wood in that because the, we had a slow combustion fire, so I, I was always chopping wood to keep the fire going so we had hot water. It was one of them old ones that burns and then it heats the boiler up and we've got we've got hot water without the fire going, you know, so I had to keep the – and because it's cold as hell, you don't want to be going outside all the time. You've got your wood box in the house and I've probably held about a tonne of wood. So I had to keep that stocked all the time so we could cook and have hot water and have a hot bath and that sort of stuff. So yeah, wow. at night sometimes if it ran low, um, yeah, I was proper country boy. So, you know, splitting, chopping wood, I'd been doing I'd been doing that for years. So I'd been chopping chopping wood and that was I was definitely a woodcutter from from young age. I was I was cutting, <laughs> chopping chopping wood. So um so I was able to swing an axe really, really, really precise by the time I was twelve. I could really swing an axe. With that tracks down, going and don't want to send a piece of wood now. Oh, I can't. I fucking hate it. I, I, I hate it. But, but um, with my son's boxing, actually, I, I, I bought a sledgehammer and a tire. I go, here you go. He's a taste of my childhood, man. Do it for four hours. You know. Yeah. So anyway, um, at night, like, sometimes if the wood ran low, cause sometimes I've been protesting, like, no, nah, I'm not fucking doing it. Fuck you. Like, going off because that's why I was. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, you have to go out and get wood from the wood you know from the wood pile out there in the bush um here's a wheelbarrow fill it up with wood and, and you got to, i've got to go out into the you know into the dark into the bush where the wood pile is uh for me that was not with all this stuff going on that you know when you know with all these little things that i can't explain sketchy yeah. knowing that knowing that there's things that i can't explain out there and i've got to go out into that dark into that forest and get wood at night that that was i used to do it at the speed of sound i reckon i used to cut across the net <laughs> it's almost like a typical child they run down the hallway that's fat the hallway, go, no, uh, this way or run up because it was because some monster's going to get you from behind or something like you know? so we had yeah we had long drop toilet you know you you, you just we're a bioacoustic bioelectric transmitter so that our whole like 90 percent of our 97 percent of our um dna's function is to actually act as a bioacoustic bioelectric transmitter. So only three only three percent of our genetic function is actually to pr- reproduce the physical body, to reproduce the proteins that make our physical our physical body, right? The vessel that carries our spirit or our soul. So the other ninety seven percent, which they call junk DNA, is actually what we really are, and that's a, that's basically just a a living antenna, right? And so when when you're getting that feeling, those hairs stand in the back of your neck and you're like, you know, I can feel something or I feel like I'm being watched, there's a good chance you are because you're picking up on something. Yeah. Something else is watching you and sending out a signal to the universe that it's watching you and you're picking up on something. Yeah. You're picking up on it. You know, you can sense if someone, you know, like you've probably had a, I don't know what sort of life you've had, but yeah, most have had a scrap at some point. You knew that guy in front of you was going to suck you in the mouth before he did it. Yeah. You know, like... It's not, right. it's not something unrelated to fighting or anything, regardless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. going to come at you, but you just don't have the reaction yeah. that he wanted to go on. Yeah, Exa- exactly. You can you can sense it before it's coming, but but you don't react and you, you don't listen to your instinct there, which is that's that bioacoustic that 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 transmitter. You know, there's there's signals out in the universe, and you're picking up on it. So I used to really feel like something was watching me out there. Something something was watching and possibly hunting me. That's what it felt like. You know, it felt like I was this little. You know, little skinny kid, you know, but I had an axe. Yeah, and I was you that little man. Yeah, that one. On the- it was kind of like you. It was kind of like you know, um, swing, split some wood, turn around. We yeah, you, know, you got the axe cupped ready to smack something. You know, like that. That's it. I'd be out there chop. Yeah, you know, is anything there behind me? You know, so it was. You know, I was terrified. Just my whole experience out there was just just a horrible, uh, horrible time in my life. It was um, it just left me shattered. Left me absolutely emotionally shattered. So, like by the end of that year, um, you know, I, I ended up um, spending like three years at a boys' hostel after this. After that that year, I was completely fucking absolutely shattered. Yeah. So, took him out to bring me out of my shell after that because I was sound like just rattled from from my stepmother, from everything that was going on, being cut off from the world, from 
having these weird things go on that were traumatic and not being able to talk about it to anybody or explain to anybody. Now, the other thing is I've got physical scars from, from these experiences. So from, from, yeah, from those particular experiences, I've got physical scars. So, um, as I said, I don't think they were out to hurt, but there's an element of maybe they want to test what kind of pain you can handle or something, you know, like, you know what I mean? Like maybe maybe they're Russian. <laughs> you know, they're trying to be Russian. Yeah. They'll see where you can land. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Because I I woke up one night and just getting like whipped, like whipped. That's the only way to explain it. I was getting fucking whipped by nothing that I could. I, I couldn't say anything, but I was getting whipped, like flogged by something, and it was just hitting me with like hard. And I've got I've got twelve or thirteen. Um, scars that run uh, horizontal across the across the broad like on my back, right from just below my shoulder blades all the way down, um, just above my tailbone, and that's that they're they're scars from from these from these experiences from these interactions. I think my my back, yeah. There's about so I can I can prove that I can I can provide a photo because I went to bed without them scars and I wake up with them. Yeah, okay. so, and then I'm sort of um. Like a, a sore scar, like a sort of scabby, or, or just like a bit of a, uh, like you know, an old sort of scar has been there for a while. It's like a line of a scar, sort of thing. No, you can feel it. it's like it's like um, almost imagine like an African warrior has been bloody yeah they they scar their chest or whatever, and they've got them keloid raised scars on their on their chest to prove that they're a warrior or a landowner or whatever. They, you know, the tribal tribal sort of you know the way the way they do things over in. Africa, or even some parts of New Guinea and places like yeah, men have got to have scars, right? Yeah. Um, to be a warrior or whatever. Well, it's it's a bit like that. Imagine those, but it's just from being like something whipping, something really whipping, like a piece of wire or or something like that. Yeah, okay. Um, that, when that was happening? Oh yeah, yeah. I wake up and it was excruciatingly painful. Each each blow was excruciatingly painful. And I actually passed out while it was still happening. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah. Doing the party in itself as well. Well, there's not again. Like you, you're so scared, you you can't you you can't make a sound. Like you can't. There's there's nothing you can. Who are you going to call out to? You know, like 